today to have a, a Mother's Day celebration. We're going to have some baby dedications, and I'm going to pass the mic to, uh, I'm going to start with Caitlin, and then she's going to pass it all the way down, and then we will uh, have a few questions to ask them, and then we'll turn right around and ask you one question, okay? All right, this is Grady. Um, ever since I was a little girl, I dreamed of being a mom. So on January 16th, I had artificial insemination. January 31st, the Lord answered our prayers, and we got a positive pregnancy test. He has some great role models, Yagon Poppy, Lily, and Jojo, and our sweet little Landon. But we do ask for your love, support, and prayers as we take on this journey together. Hey, I'm Perry. Um, this is my wife, Jamie, and this is our sweet but big-headed girl, uh, Mia. Um, I've been here for 18 years. This church has done so much for me. Um, you know, it's provided me with, you know, a father, a family, and, you know, the Lord as well. So um, we just really appreciate everything y'all have done for us, and um, hopefully she can have the same experiences that I've had, you know, in the 18 years that I've been here. So we really appreciate y'all. Good morning, everybody. Um, my name's Stephen. This is my wife, Megan. And then this is our little I, bundle of joy. <laughs> <laughs> she probably wouldn't want me to call him what she calls him, but, you know, <laughs> nothing bad. Um, SJ, we call him SJ. His name is Stephen James. He's named after me and his granddad. Um, we're trying to make sure he lives the same life she left, she lived and that I lived going through some hard times and all that, make sure the Lord's present. But, you know, me being a father now with him has taught us so much, becoming together, being one as a family, and that we just hope this brings him closer to everybody, closer to having a life with God in it. And then <laughs> he's a little nervous. But, <laughs> um, but, yeah, we just wish for everybody's support in this. Well, this is one way we grow our children's ministry, and we are thrilled to have them to be a part of our kids at the Grove, and SJ's already experienced in the nursery, so he is old hat at, but we have something special for you to remember this day, because it is a very special day. So let me find your gifts for you. Mia, here's a sweet gift for you. And this is for Grady and Mom. And last, for SJ. Let me pray. Just a quite obvious question. You can answer it, I do. But do you acknowledge your child as a gift from God? Yeah. Do you so desire to live your life in such a way that your little child can look up to you and see Jesus in your life and want that same Jesus in theirs? Now, church, this is your response, and you can respond with the I do. But you're going to respond with it and also stand to it. Do you as a church recognize that you have a responsibility before these families right here to live your life, not just in a controlled setting like a sanctuary, but in the uncontrolled settings like the marketplace, in the schoolyard, or in public events. Do you so desire to live your life in such a way that you would reflect the glory of God, the goodness of God, and the lives of these families to also to set an example to help them and not do anything to hurt them. Do you so dedicate yourself to that end? Your response is? Let's... I will tell you, families, you look out there and you see this is, this is why we do church. Because we're in this thing together. We have a vested interest in your life. And we get, care about what happens to your children, but we care about what happens to you. God, 
doesn't expect you to be perfect parents, but God expects you as parents to trust the perfect God. Okay? Miss Susan is going to lead us in a prayer of dedication. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful that you are a perfect God. And in this imperfect world, Lord, we know that you will guide and direct their steps. Father, we thank you for Grady and Mia and SJ. And Lord, just to think that someday they'll be a part of Vacation Bible School and RAs and GAs and Kids Camp. Lord, I just pray that this church family will be the example that they need. I pray for the parents, God, that they is a... Um, as they get into your word, they'll find the way to lead their children to you. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Welcome to our Becoming Your Mom support group. Uh, we have some visitors with us today. Welcome to you. My name is Mark, and I'm the group leader. And I think we'll start by reciting our mission statement. We love our moms, but we are not our moms. We love our moms, but we are not our moms. Carol, would you mind starting us off this week? Hi everyone, I'm Carol. Hi Carol. I am the oldest of three roommates and I'm turning into my mom. I clean up everything after them. I've even started doing their laundry. I talk to myself in the grocery store all the time. All of my status updates are just pictures of kids. I don't even have kids. Same, well, kids and recipes. The other day, I almost licked my finger and wiped the face of a total stranger. I keep saying words like garbage and tarje. What is that? I'll send a text to someone just to let them know I sent them an email. Well, how else would they know? Right? I mean, these shoes were on sale. What am I supposed to do? Not buy them? I call my husband my son's name. And sometimes I call my son the dog's name. I always tell people, I'll be like two minutes. Then it'll be like an hour. <laughs> Whoa, whoa, take it easy there. Shannon already has a tissue. We really don't need to offer her one. I do. Did you see how they let the momness overtake them? So you may not be able to avoid becoming your mom, but the key is to let the beautiful things about moms shine through in your life. The kindness, the caring, the compassion, the qualities that God gave moms when he created them. Oh. Like when I text my friends, LOL, lots of love. That's not what LOL means. That's what my son told me it meant. LOL, lots of love. What else would it mean? You know, I used to be an amazing dancer. Now when I dance, people just get embarrassed. Can I show you? Yeah. Oh, no, Carol. Oh, Carol, sit down. Oh, wow. It's not bad. Carol, please. One, two. Good morning. This is a poem I wrote for Mother's Day. There holds a day special. There holds a day true. There holds a day meant solely for you. Some have the honor of carrying our lives. Others got his knit for a specific moment in time. To the ones who were there for our first tiny heartbeat, who endured the journey, also often tiresome but sweet, whose heart would rejoice at the sound of our cries as a new love filled your heart and tears filled your eyes. You nursed us and clothed us and gave us so much more than our selfish hearts could ever implore. Behind you who have held our lives in your hands, often lies a lady much wiser and more grand. A lady so worthy, she has promoted a new title. Whether it be Mimi, Lulu, Honey, her presence is vital. One must not forget those who relation not the same, but have seen our lives through the sun and the rain. Their blood not our own and their role not obliged. Their leadership, love, and prayer is to be recognized. In this world, there are many who God allows to take us by the hand, to keep us and teach us there's so much to understand. The greatness seen in these ladies we've known is what will make us great mothers and fathers of our own. So to you who women who fill our lives with much joy and prayer, happy Mother's Day. Thank you for your love and care.
can turn with me to Psalm 136, which is where that song came from. And I'm going to read just a few of the verses in a very long psalm. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His faithful love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods, because his faithful love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords. His faithful love endures forever. And give thanks to him alone who does mighty miracles, because his faithful love endures forever. Let's keep worshiping.
Matthew chapter 5. Jesus is speaking on the northern shore of the Sea of Galilee. There, there was a crowd that came to where Jesus was, and there always was a crowd around Jesus. I mean, wherever Jesus went, people wanted to be with him or around him. He had something to say that was worth hearing. For many people, they came to Jesus for what they could get from Jesus. For some of them, they wanted better health. For some of them, they possibly wanted wealth. For some of them, they wanted power or prestige or something that only Jesus could give them. For some of them, they just wanted a morsel of food because they were hungry. Or maybe they were thirsty for something of life full of meaning. Maybe they were. But for whatever reason, they came to where Jesus was. And on this northern shore of the Sea of Galilee that day, Jesus spoke what we know and understand to be, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, to be the sermon on the mountainside that overlooked the Sea of Galilee. And they came to hear what Jesus had to say. Jesus had run through all the Beatitudes, those eight attitudes and eight characteristics of the ch children of God. And no sooner than he gets through with persecution than he says, this is how it all looks. You, my friend, are the salt of the earth. But if the salt shall lose its taste, how can it be made salty? It is no longer good for anything but to be thrown out and to trampled under the people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city situated on a hill cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and puts it under a basket, but rather on a lampstand, and he gives light for all who are in the house. In the same way, he said, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. And I thought, what a practical way to unpack what Mother's Day really is. Because if I think of mothers, I think of the value of mothers, and I think of the visibility of mothers. And the value of mothers speaks to the salt of mothers. I mean, mothers are the salt of the earth. That's what the Bible says. You are the salt of the earth. And when Jesus spoke those words, he spoke it to those. They're only, the only ones qualified to be salt were those who believed in Jesus. Because we're not going to become salt. We are salt the moment we believe. At the very moment we believe, we are the salt of the earth. That's what he's saying. And he's reminding those moms and those who would be moms and those other people out there in that crowd, listen, you are the salt of this world. You're the salt of this earth. And he tells them right then and there, that nobody in this world can be salt for you but you. Nobody can be salt for you but you. Nobody can be your salt but you. And he tells us that. When Jesus said, you're the salt of the earth, he was speaking to anyone and everyone that had believed in him. And he reminded them, this is now who you are. This is your identity. Now that changes everything when we understand that. Because nobody can witness for you but you. And mom, nobody can be salt for you but you. I'm thankful for granny salt. I'm thankful for aunt salt. I'm thankful for next door neighbor uh, uh, Louisa salt. But I'm telling you that Jesus said, you, mom, you are the salt of the earth. That is who you are. And he tells us and he reminds us and he reminds these that are there that day and especially those moms that are there that day that nobody can be sought for you but you. The second day, thing he does, he tells us about salt. He says salt doesn't exist for itself. Have you ever thought about that? I mean, what is salt? Salt didn't exist just to have a salt conviction. We don't have salt just to have more salt. Salt exists for others. Salt is no value in a shaker. Salt is no value on a shelf. Salt is only valuable when it's being exposed and put out there for others to embrace it, to experience it. You see that when it really speaks of the life of mothers. And you see it in the life of Jesus. In fact, in the life of Jesus, there were two major bodies of water that Jesus spent time around. One of them, he spent about 80% of his public ministry around. And then it was called the Sea 
of Galilee. It wasn't a massive sea. It was a sea about 13 miles wide and uh, along and about seven and a half miles wide. It was where Jesus was speaking the Sermon on the Mount. But there was another big body of water about 80 miles south of there. And it was called the Dead Sea. And the Dead Sea, on the other hand, was much larger. It was 50 miles long and about 11 miles wide. Even though there were massive bodies of water, they were extremely different. In fact, you could go to the Sea of Galilee today and it's lush around it. There's fish in it and people love to get out in it and swim and go fishing in it. Still to this very day, they do that. But you go about 80 miles south and I'm going to tell you the Dead Sea's dead. People go there, you will not catch fish in the Dead Sea. There will be no algae growing in the Dead Sea. It is as dead as dead could possibly be. It is dead because it is so contaminated with salt. It has about a 37% salt content. I've been there on two separate occasions to the Dead Sea. On one occasion, I went and swam in it, and it was wonderful. On the other occasion, I showed up there, and I had a, a, something going on that I had a sore, and I didn't realize I had it till I got in it. And the salt attached it. For instance, if you're a football player and you've got an athlete's foot, you don't want to go to the Dead Sea. But if you've got something else that comes with being a football player, you don't want to be in the Dead Sea either. Because it will light you on fire. You will walk on the Dead Sea because it burns you. Why? Because the Dead Sea is filled with all these minerals and people from all over the world come there to bathe in those minerals. But there's no life in the Dead Sea. None whatsoever. And you know this, the Dead Sea is fed by the same Jordan River that feeds the Sea of Galilee. It comes all the way down 85 miles and it feeds the Dead Sea. But the difference between the Dead Sea and the Sea of Galilee is that one has an exit and the other one don't. The, the Sea of Galilee has streams that leave from it and it feeds and other people benefit from it. But when it gets to the Dead Sea, it's the dead end. And all that is there is the contamination of the salt that has destroyed everything that it touches there. In fact, when fish swim in from the, uh, from the Jordan River and swim into the Dead Sea, they immediately die. Because fish cannot live in the Dead Sea. And the only way that, that that Sea of Galilee produces fish, it has a tributary that leaves it. See, the picture of all of that is this, is that salt in and of itself does not exist for itself. That its whole purpose of existing is to exit and to leave us. Jesus doesn't tell us that we ought to be salt or we should be salt. He says you are salt. And because you are salt, then you're the salt of the earth. I love what a, a, a professor said of the previous century. He spoke about, E. Stanley Jones said this about the modern church of that day in the last century. He said the number one problem of the church today is irrelevance. He said the number one problem with the church was irrelevance. I will tell you the number one problem with being a mother today is when you feel irrelevant. You don't feel needed. You don't feel that people, that you're required for anything. But the Bible says because you are a child of God, there's no way you can be irrelevant. That you're the salt of the earth. And because you are the salt of the earth, the Bible says that we matter. When Jesus was speaking, he wasn't speaking to pastors and missionaries and polished politicians. Jesus was speaking to the, not to the uppity up or the monkey mock. He was speaking to the average man and the average woman. He said, okay, Mr. Average, this is what's going to make you different than everybody else. You are going to be the salt. You are salt of this earth. You are salt. In other words, you have unbelievable value. Moms, you have the most amazing value in the life of your children. You're the salt of the earth to your children. 
You're that which creates desire. You're the one who creates the taste. You're the one that preserves and retards the destruction in the home. You're that very salt of the earth. That's the value of you as mom. And whether or not you have given birth to a child or not, as a motherly influence, you are the salt of the earth to those people that come alongside you and to those people that are around you. He tells us that mothers are valuable because they are the salt of the earth. But he tells us something else, that the visibility of Christian moms. He said, you are the light of the world. That's what he says about moms. Christian moms, you're the light of the world. You are a light. You are light in a dark place. The world is filled with darkness. Darkness is everywhere. But you're not going to be just any old flickering lamp. You're going to be a lamp unto me. You're going to be a light unto this world. And he reminds us that we are the light of the world. Moms are the light of the world. We are visible. We are uh, like a hill that is situated, a lamp situated on a hill that cannot be hidden. Now, while many will argue salt is far more valuable than light, all of us would have to agree that light is very valuable to our life. That living in darkness would not, is not something that we would want. We, we, would, we, we long for light. We can't go into a house at night without flipping a light. We can't even, many of you laid outside and looked up at the sky, at the northern lights. We marveled at the lights because there's something about light when the Bible says, moms, you are visible in this, that you are a light. You're a light to your family. You're called to be the light of the world. You are the light. So let your light shine, not just in church, but let your light shine in your home. And when you're away from church, you are a light. Charles Spurgeon said the Bible is not the light of the world. It's the light of the church. Charles Spurgeon said the Bible, according to Psalms, is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. That's to the child of God. But guess what? The Bible is not a light or a lamp to those that are not believers. We are the light and the lamp. Because people in your, maybe your children don't ever read the Bible. Maybe they don't ever spend time in the Word of God. But they can read your life because you are a light unto them. The place where you live, the place where you work, wherever you go in this life, they may not read that Bible, but they will read you. Because you are a light unto them. The most powerful influence you can have is being visible as a, as a follower of Christ that you demonstrate. My life is different because this is what Jesus has done. Jesus has made my life different. The greatest commandment in all the word of God says this. Jesus said, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. Second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. In other words, the greatest commandment is not a suggestion to moms. The greatest commandment to moms is the greatest commandment to dads or want to be moms or dads. And that is to love God with your heart, with, the, with that emotion part of you. With your mind, with the intellect, said so with your heart, mind, and soul, with your, with your volitional part, with the directional part of your life. In other words, that it should be something that we do automatically because we love God. We love God with everything we have. And that's why when Jesus said, he said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And this is the first, but I'm going to tell you, like it unto this is the second. And that is to love your neighbor. Think about how that would change everything. If we understood the greatest commandment not to be a suggestion, but a commandment. That God said it, and that settles it. Whether you believe it or not, God said it, and that settles it. And you're going to live your life for it. We should do that. Not only is the light visible as moms, you're visible to your family. 
And you demonstrate it by loving God. And you love your children by loving God. You, you, you love your children by obeying God. You love your children by following God. In all of that, you're letting your children see the light inside of you. Because they will want the light that you have in them. One day they will want that light. Then there's that visible expression of the invisible God. And I love this passage where Jesus will speak about in just a moment about how that we're supposed to love. And, and, and what he's saying is that, that there is an invisible God. But we are the visible expression of the invisible God. That the way you live your life and the way you conduct your life visibly shows that there is a God. You can't see him, you can't touch him, you can't smell his breath, and you can't feel his warm hand on top of you at night. But what you can know, that you can experience him so real that it, it affects everything. It becomes a visible expression in your life. This invisible God. I was reading this week about Frederick Nietzsche. Many of you, if you study philosophy, you know a little bit about Nietzsche. Nietzsche influenced people like Hitler, Stalin, and Mussolini. And they really bought into what Nietzsche had to say. And Nietzsche's philosophy was very simple. It was God is dead. That's what he said. God is dead. God is dead and he's done. There's no God. He's dead. And yet the man, the philosopher behind all of that, the German philosopher Nietzsche, influenced those people. Mussolini, Stalin, and Hitler, and at the hands of these three men alone, millions and millions of people died. Because they bought into that faulty thought that God is dead. And see, the tragedy is that when God is dead to our everyday life, then things die. Our families die. Our children die to purpose, a meaning. It's when God is dead in my everyday life and there's no visibility of God, this invisible God is not living out in me and all they see is a dead God inside of me, a God that used to be that's no longer there, then it doesn't create plus things, it creates negative things. And just as it was in Nietzsche, so it was in them. So it was in the pain of others. But yet we all know that our God is not dead. And if our God is alive, then he lives. And if he lives, he lives to live in us. And if he lives to live in us, he lives to live through us. And that's the beauty of the invisible God being visible in our life. Because he lives through us. Someone said that we live what we truly believe. And anything else we say is just religious talk. And we're good at religious talk. But if you want to know what a man or a woman or a mom or a dad believes, they believe what they live. Because if they don't live it, they sure don't believe it. And see, moms... Especially moms. Families watch you. Your children look up to you. And they wonder, do you really believe? And if you do believe, are you living what you believe? See, that is a powerful truth. The visible expression of an invisible God. Three little things, I want to close with it. When I think of the value of moms, and I think of the visibility of moms, I think to this very truth, that moms are the ones who give us life. I mean, you think of it, when God made man and woman in his image, he gifted woman with something to do that man could not do. Woman could give life. A woman can do it. No man can do that. No matter what science is telling you now, no man can give life. 
But God gifted woman with the ability to give life. Moms give life. They give new life. Moms don't have babies of people that uh, of, 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 uh, have, give birth to babies of people that give back their babies in return because they didn't like them. No, no, no. They give out brand new babies. There's no baby quite like you when you were born. There's no DNA in you that's like you. You are a brand new baby. Guess who gave you that life? Moms did. Moms give life. But like it unto God, Jesus Christ is the one who gives real life. Moms can give us life biologically, but Jesus can give us life supernaturally. But we can't have one without the biology to have the supernatural. Moms give new life. Moms welcome and nurture. I mean, by nature, women are nurturers, right? We know that. By nature. In fact, the Bible says, wives, submit to your husbands as unto the Lord. Because the husband is the head of the wife and Christ is the head of the church. And he's the savior of the body. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives are to submit to their husbands and everything. And I know what you're thinking. This is the 21st century. And I don't like that word submit attached to my life. But you've got to read the whole book, the chapter there. Because right after that, it says, Husbands, love your wives like Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. What did Jesus do for the church? He bled out, stripped naked, nailed to a cross. He did that for the church. How should husbands love their wives just like that? In total sacrifice to whatever is required for our family. But he says that what do moms do? Moms welcome submission. And that ultimate submission is submission to God. Moms welcome that because they know that their nurturing capability in their life cannot be maximized until they walk in submission to God. You have to walk in that. Moms welcome and they are nurturers by nature. Moms have faith, but not all moms necessarily have children. That is so true. Paul told to Timothy in 2 Timothy at the end of his life, Paul said to Timothy, he says, listen, don't forget, Timothy, about your, your mother Lois and your grandmother Eunice. Don't forget about their unfinished faith. That reminds us that, that moms have faith. They have faith. They don't just see what it is. They see what it can be. They have faith. And they can have faith in God. And that faith in God does not mean that they're always going to be able to have offspring. I mean, you heard just a moment ago. I always wanted to be a mom. I always wanted to have a baby. And it was just not up for me to be able to have that. And yet... If it had not have been for intervention, I would not be able to have my baby. Can I tell you, there are a lot of moms who never have children. But they are the mothers of our life. And I can go through, and I mentioned at the beginning, a litany, a, li a list as long as my leg of the women that have impacted my life. And the last thing, very quickly, is mothers, if they show us anything, they show us God. That's the visible expression of the invisible God. They show us God. In fact, Jesus is speaking. And Jesus says to Jerusalem in Matthew, the scripture says in Matthew 23, he says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stone those who are sent to her. How often I would have gathered you together as a mother hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. Right there, Jesus is giving them an illustration. He said, I would have been like that mother hen. And Jesus is likening himself as to a mother hen. Why? Because it's, it's not the rooster that's protecting the babies. It's the mothers that protect them. 
And Jesus didn't use roosters as an illustration. He used the motherly hen as an illustration. He said, just as, as I would have gathered you together, as a mother hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. I would have done that for you. See, our moms show us God. And if you're a mom today, that is your number one responsibility to show God. Show God to your children. Demonstrate God as a light that is visible and salt that is valuable. And walk out your faith every day with this understanding that what I am doing is I am preparing my children so that one day when they face life, or they face the end of life, or they face adolescence or puberty, I'm showing them that there is a God that is big enough to get them through whatever crisis they go through. And moms, you can do that. Nobody is more gifted to do that in the life of a child than a mother or a motherly influence. So don't ever underestimate the power of your influence in your children's life your nieces and nephews' lives, your grandchildren's lives, or those that are just in your church family life, you are light to their life and you are the salt to their world. Let's pray. Last week, many of you turned in those cards that said salt and light, and I want to be salt and light to this person. And We can pile that list of 100 plus names that you turned in. And we are praying to this end that God would use you to be salt and light to them. On this Mother's Day morning, have you come to that place in your life that you believe that Jesus Christ is your Savior? Have you turned from sin to Him? Have you asked Him to forgive you of the sin that's in your life today. Could this Mother's Day be that turning point in your life that you say, today is the day that I go all in with Jesus. I surrender my life to Jesus today. I give my life to Christ. For many of us sitting here today, there are a lot of things that we wish we'd have done differently or we could have done differently. But yet one thing that we are grateful for, and myself included, I am grateful that in spite of all the mistakes I've made as a Christian, I'm so glad I made them as a Christian. Not as somebody that's lost in this world. So can I challenge you today to know this? That once you give Christ your life, then you think differently about your sin. And you can never, you can never enjoy your sin like you once could. Because you've trusted Jesus to lead you away from darkness. And to lead you in a different path. Have you trusted Jesus to guide your life? to change your life, to use your life? If you're a mother today and sitting here in this room as a woman that makes up this 
part of this congregation today and your heart's broken because it's hard being a, being a parent. It's hard being a, maybe a single parent. It, it's hard to, to stand for things that are right when all around you people stand for wrong. And today you just need the courage to stand for Jesus. Would you know this today, that Jesus knows where you are and he knows you by name? And he's more than enough to help you to be salt and light right where you are. Father, in this room, I'm sure there are those who who've thought about it a thousand times, what would it look like if I gave my whole life to Jesus? And Lord, in this room today, there is that battle. And what needs to happen as a result of that struggle is that they need to walk away from here saying they've given their whole life to Jesus. Not just part of their life, not just their work life or their night life, but their whole life. Lord, would you do something that only you can do today? Would you break the hearts of those whose hearts should be broken over things that break yours? And would you cause us, oh God, to not be ashamed to stand for you and to live for you. In Jesus' name. Let's all stand to our feet. Invitation, the response, the time where you stand where you are and you can come forward, you can kneel at this altar, you can see somebody beside you, you can call the church, you can do a lot of things. Let me tell you what you need to do right here, right now, is let this be that moment in your life that you do whatever business you need to do, you do it with God now. Don't wait and say, I'll do it next week or next year or tomorrow. You do business with God right now, right here. You let God do what God wants to do in your life. Don't push him away. Just surrender to him today. And God will do for you what you could never imagine. God will give you a life filled with peace and purpose and meaning. We have that in Jesus. Let's sing.